Before we dive into despair, this video is sponsored by Vezi. As we approach the summer season, why not indulge in some spicy Vezi footwear as they provide you with both the necessary comfort and support and the dapper quality to turn a few heads in utter awe and jealousy. Sustainably designed with their own unique Dymatex material, which is always a great word to say, Vezi shoes seek to keep your feet cool in the summer and warm in the winter. Or if you're here in Ireland like me, mostly to keep you warm because the sun doesn't seem to like us very much. Even better yet, these are legitimately the best waterproof shoes I've ever owned because despite stepping in many puddles and mud during my clumsy travels, I've never had a single drop seep through. Vezis have been my absolute go-to shoes for months now because they're so easy to slip on and leisurely go about my day without any issue, especially if I'm on long walks or rough terrain and just on an aesthetic level they pretty much go with all my clothes which is helpful for someone as fashionably hopeless as myself. You can get yourself a pair by clicking the link in the description box below and using my code Ryan Hollinger to get $25 off your order. And by doing so, you'll also be greatly supporting the channel because YouTube does not like horror as much as Vezi does. And if you do order a pair, let me know which ones you get because I'm currently browsing for another pair as we speak. And now, on to the video. It's been nearly 20 years since the release of Alejandro Aminabar's supernatural gothic horror, The Others. It was not an underrated film by any means, it was a major critical and commercial success when it released in 2001, thanks to the immense star power of Nicole Kidman and the fact that it was one of the most acclaimed western horrors in quite some time. Unlike the chaotic Hollywood jump cutty popcorn flicks that characterised much of early 21st century horror such as the forever cheeky 13 Ghosts and another star part fusion of the psychological and supernatural in the form of Gothica, the others distinguished itself in its strictly subtle and introspective approach to the genre. It released at a perfect time when supernatural horror was not only trendy but thematically driven narratives were once again growing in regularity with Japan's Pulse and Spain's own gothic horror The Devil's Backbone releasing the same year to commercially unsuccessful results despite their comfortable critical and cult appreciation. You could say a major part of its appeal was that its marketing, particularly its trailer, kept all the supernatural stuff an unseen mystery. The emphasis was almost exclusively on character. Unlike other horror media that frequently gave away imagery to desperately appeal to the younger demographic these films were typically popular with. However, what made the others stand out as an original take on the supernatural was that behind its sinister scares was a poignant and sometimes agonising meditation on mortality during a time of unprecedented uncertainty. Set at the end of the Second World War in 1945, a religiously authoritative mother called Grace anxiously awaits the return of her husband Charles, who left her and her children to serve in the military, where she invites a family of caretakers to tend to her property on the island of Jersey near Normandy, France, while she can focus on mothering her two children, who are photosensitive to daylight. From here, madness begins to ensue as the children claim to see the spirit of a boy called Victor and Grace's attempts to refute it become challenged by the increasing abnormalities around the house. While circumstantially it is a traditional ghost story, when put into context it's just as much of a story about the burden of repression and why many of us hold hopes and beliefs as a way to cope when we feel most alone. According to writer-director Alejandro Aminabar, the story is told from the perspective of agnosticism as it explores Grace's fearful devotion to God, yet as someone who believes in something so extraordinary and divine, her rejection of any supernatural presence becomes a point of suspicion. Don't worry, this won't be another video talking about religion, but instead, as Alejandro Aminabar states, the ambiguity and lack of clarity we usually experience in life is integral to each character's journey within the story. There isn't always an answer for everything. 
Yes, the film does give us a shocking explanation for what is actually going on, but to focus purely on that would rob you of the personal tale that Amenabar aims to tell, so we'll come back to that later. The thing about ghost stories is that they're not just explicitly about scares, they're human tragedies and cautionary tales about lives left incomplete or unfulfilled, and the guilt, grief, trauma and doubt we all experience at some point in our lives. They hit hardest in times when death is closest to us, as it's the purest fear we can all equally relate to, even if we each deal with it very differently. Although, at the same time, we frequently see many of these stories as about vengeance, because they play into historical superstitions about morality and punishment, and how human deceit and wrongdoing will eventually come back to haunt us, and all of this, whether you see it one way or the other, is softly interwoven into the others, outside of its one admittedly unsubtle point about the characters being trapped in limbo, as the house is consumed by a brooding fog. Even when you start attaching all of the director's symbolism to the film, it never disrupts the storytelling as it always progresses towards an endgame that increases in urgency the closer we get to it due to Grace's withering disillusionment. Her turbulent relationship with her children certainly brings about the realist sense of danger, as she clearly loves them but aggressively restricts how they live their lives to the point she literally keeps them in the dark about the real world. Now, I'm not a parent, but even I can tell you her methods aren't, uh, healthy to say the least, as she basically tries to fearmonger her children into obedience or risk being condemned to what she describes as the children's limbo, a place of damnation. That's where children go who tell lies, but they don't just go there for a few days. Oh no. No, they're damned. Try to imagine. The end of eternity. The children are seemingly confined to a life of preparing for the afterlife, rather than living in the moment like they should be. They are without innocence and made to feel guilty of sin. They are the true victims of the story. However, where the film got to me was how it makes this big, empty house feel smaller and smaller as the emotional turmoil consumes every room and corridor. I have a tremendous dislike of silence. I need noise and distraction to stop intrusive negative thoughts from eating away at my brain, and so if I'm alone in my house and don't have something to stimulate my attention, those problems become unearthed and stop me from just getting on with things. The director was so focused on the silence that it becomes borderline unnatural at times, and it works well alongside the lack of what we see. In 2012's The Woman in Black, it took a few similar notes in the use of space to make you feel dread as if the ghost was lingering in the background or something was constantly watching the characters. It usually was, and it made for some really effective scares despite the heavy music cues. But The Others works by showing you almost nothing, and keeps your attention firmly on Grace to add a sense of doubt as to whether there really are ghosts or Grace has just lost control. This is actually why the film popped back into my mind recently. During the last few months of COVID lockdown, especially during winter, my mind has started projecting really negative perceptions onto my home that make it very difficult to relax anymore. Nothing is out of the ordinary, but the greater awareness of repetition makes the waiting for the end to come just a little more unbearable each day. But the thing is, the longer I stay in the mindset of looking forward to the end of lockdown, it makes me feel more depressed in the moment because I think about how the current situation sucks and the wait thus feels longer. Anyway, my point is, that restlessness, granted in a completely different context, comes across greatly in the others, as that's essentially Grace's behaviour. She's waiting for something good to come, and until that happens, she's incapable of moving on with her life or simply feeling any sense of ease. Additionally, that unnatural silence is further perpetuated by the characters speaking softly and quietly because Grace makes it clear that she's obsessively attempting to maintain that silence, that the faintest disturbance completely unsettles her. There is something in this house. Something diabolic. Something which is not. Not at rest. 
As a result, when the supernatural stuff escalates, it looks more like Grace is trying to suppress the issue rather than uncover the truth, which is exactly what the director wants you to feel given his openly heavy use of metaphors that all speak for themselves. The home should be a symbol of safety and sanctuary, but it's now poisoned by fear. That means it's time for spoilers, so uh, I recommend checking out the film for yourself, in which case go off and do that, and if you want to stick around, brace yourself. So basically, the big twist is that the characters were dead all along, as Grace smothered her children before shooting herself, while the caretakers died of tuberculosis long before. The boy Victor, who the children claim to see, is the son of the current occupiers, who hire a spiritual medium to communicate with the dead. It intelligently puts all of Alejandro and Minabar's symbols and imagery into perspective, and as you can see, I wasn't exactly subtle about alluding to it throughout the video. Mummy went mad. Nothing happened. Yes, it did. No, it didn't! Yes, it did! Be quiet! Grace is being confronted with what she did, and the role of the caretakers was to help guide her into accepting what happened. The general implication is that her husband never returned from war, and Grace's instability worsened, leading to her violent, devastating actions. What it ultimately serves to do is give us that bittersweet sense of closure most of us eventually try to seek in life. However, it isn't as definitive as it appears, because while Grace considers it a gift from God to have a second chance, that's simply her way of accepting it, and regardless of the ultimate truth, achieving peace is all that matters to these characters. I guess that's what most of us simply want from life. Grace can't change what she did, but if there really is something beyond life as the agnostic perspective of the film aims to show, we can only hope it gives us a chance to finally put our fears to rest.